Welcome. On behalf of the U.S. Institute of Peace, I'm glad you can join us today for a very important discussion about Sri Lanka. Today, we're thinking about Sri Lanka one year after the historic Aragalia protest and the worst economic default in Sri Lanka's history since independence. My name is Tamanna Salakuddin. I'm director for South Asia programs at the U.S. Institute of Peace, and we are very excited for you to join today's uh, discussion. If you have questions, questions, uh, please follow along on our website. There is a Q&A box where you can go ahead and put in questions for all our panelists. We'll start by opening remarks, and then we will turn to your questions uh, later during the event today. Many of us sitting here in Washington uh, last July, a year ago, were watching images from Colombo of protesters taking over the presidential palace in response to Sri Lanka's worst economic crisis since independence. In the years since, there have been a lot of developments, but today we want to discuss how far Sri Lanka has actually come. It has secured a $2.9 billion bailout from the IMF in March. It started to implement parts of that agreement, including a domestic debt restructuring plan. However, Sri Lanka's economic problems are far from fixed. According to the World Bank, Sri Lanka's poverty rate nearly doubled to 25% of the population last year, and it could jump to 27.4% this year alone. This year, all this also marks one year since Pre President Ranil Vikramasinghe was elected by the existing parliament, a parliament that was previously headed by President Gotabaya Rajapaksa and hasn't changed uh, due to postponed elections. Since taking office, Vikramasinghe's administration has pledged to implement a truth and reconciliation mechanism to address the legacies of the Sri Lankan civil war, especially for ethnic minorities. Sri Lanka is also in a very challenging geopolitical neighborhood where there is very evident competition on the island between India and China. And while the Rajapaksas previously had very close ties to China, we see in the wake of this crisis, New Delhi has really come in and built up its relationship with Colombo stronger given uh, lines of credit and other responses to the crisis. President Vikramasinghe just visited India last week. So to discuss all of this and more, we have a great panel with us today. Uh, I'm going to briefly introduce everybody on the panel. Uh, we have Nishan Demel, who is the Executive Director of Verite Research Limited, a think tank providing analytic research and advisory services on economic, political, and legal issues in Sri Lanka and broader, broader Asia. He's an economist with extensive academic, policy, and private sector experience. We also have Nilanthi Samarnayaka, who is a visiting expert in USIP's South Asia program. In addition to USIP, she is also an adjunct fellow at the East-West Center's Washington office. She has 25 years of experience in the research sector and most recently served as Director of Strategy and Policy Analysis at CNA, where she led a team conducting multidisciplinary research. And her work focuses on regional security in the Indian Ocean. And last but certainly not least, we have Ambika Satkunathan, who is a human rights lawyer and human rights activist. From 2015 to 2020, she was commissioner of the Human Rights Commission of Sri Lanka. And for nine years before that, she was a legal consultant to the UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights in Sri Lanka. Her research and advocacy and activism have focused on transitional justice, custodial violence, penal policy, and prison reform gender and Tamil nationalism. We're, without further ado, I'm gonna to turn to Ambika um, to make some opening remarks, really about where have we come in one year? We saw historic protests last year. We were all watching very closely and they had, the protesters really were pushing back not only on the economic crisis, but demanding a lot of political change. And they forced President Gotabaya Rajapaksa out of office. But where have we come on all the rest of the political reforms and corruption demands um, and other issues that uh, Sri Lanka is facing? Over to you, Ambika. Uh, thank you, Tamanna, and thank you for inviting me to be part of the panel. 
I think the more things change, the more they stay the same. Because as you yourself mentioned, uh, we've only had one change in that Gotabe Rajapaksa is no longer president. We have Ranil Vikramasinghe as president, but he was elected uh, by parliament by members of Gotabe Rajapaksa's party. So in effect, it is still the same government, the same ministers, and the same political culture. For example, we heard uh, recently that members of Gotabe Rajapaksa's party, the SLPP, they're demanding portfolios that even in the midst of the economic crisis, they want to be ministers, deputy ministers. Uh, and we saw the Minister of Health, for instance, stand up in parliament and make really callous remarks about recent deaths due to um, uh, using um, uh, me medicine, you know, that was clearly tainted and which was procured without following due process, without transparency, cutting corners. So it is pretty much, I would say, the same. We do not have that person as head of government, but everything else is pretty much the same. And uh, I would like to move away from the current issues and talk a little bit about the structural issues, because I think for the international community, the United Nations, it is important to uh, uh, address those and to also look at it in an historical perspective as that is relevant. Um, so all this comes down to the fact that Sri Lanka has an accountability problem. But when we say this, everyone immediately thinks of war crimes. But Sri Lanka has a broader accountability problem. It is this that led to not only the grave human rights violations during the war, but even the current economic crisis. The root causes of the economic crisis are systemic and structural. So uh, merely passing a law or setting up an institution is not going to fix it. Uh, things such as unaccountable executive presidency, lacks of checks and balances on government decision-making processes, disrespect for the rule of law, the sense of impunity, lack of transparency, which are also behaviors and cultures and not just uh, something that can be reformed through law. The root causes of the ethnic conflict, such as the Sinhala Buddhist state, the deep-rooted racism, are also connected to the economic crisis because it is due to these factors, the Rajapaksas, who have now wrecked havoc on the polity and the economy, the fact it is because of these factors they were re-elected despite their appalling governance record. Impunity is entrenched. But it's not only politicians, the military or the police, but a range of state actors from di directors of government departments to what we call the Grama Nil Niladaris, which are the village level offices. All of them engage in the abuse of power, exploitation and corruption every day and escape accountability. This everyday nature of impunity has eroded respect for the rule of law and created an environment for a certain type of lawless to become normalized. Now, the Aragalaya that you mentioned did change this to some extent. It made citizens demand accountability, at least in relation to certain issues such as public finance, you know, corruption. However, as always in Sri Lanka, the Aragalaya changed it for a moment in our history. And we failed to capitalize on that moment and to address the root causes of the ailing dysfunctional deeply dysfunctional Sri Lankan state. But what is interesting is that the silences and the erasures in Daragali, and this is something I've written about in the past, such as, you know, um, war crimes, ethnic conflict, political solution, those silences and gaps, they mirror the silences and gaps we've had throughout our post-colonial history, pointing to deep-rooted reluctance to address these issues. Now, in post-colonial Sri Lanka, we witnessed numerous efforts over the decades to reform the state and restructure constitutional and institutional arrangements. Yet, in each instance, reform attempts have taken place only at the convenience of the executive, with the you know purpose of gaining some sort of political advantage, or at the behest of bilateral or multilateral institutions, such as the United Nations. I would say the same is taking taking place now where the economy is concerned. The political class's lack of interest in effecting meaningful change is a feature observed in successive regimes. 
But this is due not only to the political class, but also other powerful actors, such as the corporate sector, having vested interest in maintaining the status quo. Reform in Sri Lanka has therefore been reactive rather than proactive, with addressing the root causes always left for later. One of the root causes that brought Sri Lanka to this crisis point are informal processes that undermine the rule of law. Now, this came into being because formal rules and procedures failed to function effectively or they were applied unequally or in a biased manner, which meant that people found another way to get around them and to get things done. This led to a parallel system of informal rules and processes which undermine institutions and legal processes and any even any reform processes have been scuttled because of this. Once again, this is not new, but the Rajapaksas, the two Rajapaksa re regimes really entrenched it because they actively enabled and encouraged it because they wanted to destroy a rule-based system. But while the state flouts the law with impunity, what we are seeing is that the law has also become the state's weapon of choice to control social behavior, particularly dissent. The law is therefore being used as a tool of oppression in three ways. Firstly, it uses existing repressive laws. So we have the Prevention of Terrorism Act, we have the Vagrants Ordinance. And secondly, it um, uh, tries to enact new repressive laws like the Anti-Terrorism Bill and the Broadcast Authority Act. Thirdly, it weaponizes or subverts laws which are meant to actually protect human rights, such as the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights Act, which it has ironically used to curtail freedom of expression. So how can we or how do we resist this? Now, in Sri Lanka, we haven't seen mass grassroots organizing or mobilization such as in India to resist authoritarianism. Resistance has been fragmented and there aren't many collective that, collectives that consistently challenge and push back. The forms of resistance that are noteworthy are those by the victim survivor, survivors themselves, such as the families of the disappeared, the communities whose lands were acquired or occupied by the military. We are also increasingly witnessing protests by economically marginalized groups regarding labor rights and social protection, which once again, the state is trying to repress. Uh, given the high level of corruption we have, the dysfunctional state coupled with systemic discrimination, those such as the plantation community, people in the north and the east, the Tamils, who have been subject to historical discrimination, along with other marginalized groups such as women heads of households, persons with disabilities, these groups are going to be severely affected during the economic crisis and the uh, future and ongoing various economic and legal reform processes the government undertakes as part of the IMF bailout. However, any effort to provide redress to these groups will be undermined and stymied by various vested interests unless the aforementioned underlying structural and systemic dysfunctionalities in the Sri Lankan state are addressed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambika, for that opening. You've given us a lot to discuss, and I'm, I'm excited to come back to you with questions. I want to turn to you, Nishan. Um, you visited us at USIP last summer, and when you were here, you and I talked about basically the, uh, the Sri Lankan economy hitting rock bottom. I mean, you had sovereign debt issues, budget, current account deficits, hyperinflation, devalued currency, basically everything that could go wrong with an economy had gone wrong uh, when we talked last summer. But now you are, you know, in March, you have this almost $3 billion IMF program, which requires several reforms. I was just in Sri Lanka in May, and the casual observer will see, you know, beautiful hotels, posh restaurants full, expensive imported cars, and yet there's a dissonance. I mean, the poverty, uh, you know, numbers that I read out, that it seems that the most vulnerable are actually bearing the brunt of this crisis. I, I want to turn to you for your thoughts on how not only the economy, but the political economy is doing one year out. Thank you so much, Tamana. Great to be back with you guys. Uh, and thank you for hosting this event. Um, I'll make the brief remarks that we have to make today in three parts. So let me talk about perhaps 
uh, recovery, uh, equity, and sustainability. Uh, I won't dwell on the tragedy. <laughs> uh, I think that's well told. And I also will not repeat much of the comments that we have already published. Uh, on the recovery side, just to highlight uh, the positive aspects of it, I would say that inflation this year uh, as an annualized average is at around 5%, which is a great recovery from what it was last year going up to 70% uh, you know, year on year inflation. Interest rates, which skyrocketed to above 30% in Sri Lanka are now below 20%. Uh, and of course, there is hope that it will come down even further. Uh, tourism income has increased substantially uh, and worker remittances, which are also very important to the country, uh, has improved to almost 85% of what they were in 2019 and account really for about 50% of export revenue. You, so you can imagine how important it is for the country to have these remittances from their workers. And I would say it's uh, on exports of goods, it's more important because the export revenue does include an imported component. So worker remittances really are almost as important as exports now. And tourism uh, is still only about 50% was of what it was in 2018, about one third of the export export revenue is what it was in 2018. So, you know, positive with the glass is half full way to look at it is there's more to go uh, in attracting tourism. So the recovery hasn't started yet. Uh, the economy has lost production even up to June this year and lost jobs. Uh, but there is a sense that it is possible to start the recovery process this year. Getting into the question of equity, I, I think we all know that there are winners and losers even in a crisis with interest rates above 30%. Certainly, there were a great deal of winners. The save people who had savings, I, I think, made a lot more than that just on lending to government. Whereas those who were living in poverty or those who needed to borrow have suffered hugely. Poverty rates have more than doubled. We expect that they're above 30% in the country. Uh, and jobs have been lost month on month for over a year now, which means that people are really struggling to make ends meet and are probably only being sustained by rem remittances. So uh, what you see in Colombo, as you mentioned, I think is mostly the winners. Um, and you don't see the losers, uh, which is perhaps much of the country at the moment. The, the critical question is that of sustainability. Can Sri Lanka sustain uh, the recovery? And can this debt restructuring be sustainable? So I'm going to just share a few slides uh, just to you know think that question through. And I am hoping that the slides that I'm sharing will actually show up on your screen. Uh, just to put this in perspective, Sri Lanka has been through many IMF programs uh, and uh, not all of them uh, have been completed. In fact, almost 50% were not completed. Uh, Veritas Research has something called the IMF Tracker, and I hope somebody will put that a link to that uh, for all the people who are on the site today. You can see that 33 out of the 55 commitments currently due have been completed up to now. 14 are unknown. Eight have not been done, and it's so very important for Sri Lanka not to be business as usual. In the past, we had commitments, we didn't meet them on time, and over time, that led to difficulties in continuing the program. So Sri Lanka has now a run rate, we would say up to September of 11 commitments to meet a month, and the run rate, required run rate has been increasing. Uh, we are a cricketing nation, and I use the metaphors. But even more important or concerning is when you look at what is it that Sri Lanka is not doing. Sri Lanka is not doing things that are related to governance. Creating a fiscal transparency platform uh, to let everybody know the tax exemptions the government is giving corporates and the major procurement that government is doing was due in March, but not yet done. 
increasing betting and gaming levies. So we talk about equity. Lots of taxes have increased for lots of uh, areas and people. But for the casino and betting and gaming industry, uh, the increase that was due has not been done. Publishing reports of state-owned enterprises, financial statements. So the critical issue, I think, for sustainability is that things related to governance seem to be getting procrastinated on. And the reason that it is so important is because when you look at the history of countries that restructure debt, you know, from 1975, we realize only 41% managed to restructure once and get sustainable, 59% restructured twice. What is the key difference between countries that restructure once or twice? And you can see it in this slide here. We have data from 2000 uh, that countries that on average have more than minus 0.1 on the World Bank governance indicators, they are all in green, restructured once. Countries that had an uh, average score less than that restructured more than once, sometimes twice, thrice or more times. Uh, Belize looks like an exception, but actually its governance indicators fell after the during the first restructure. So that explains that and Grenada is the only exception to this rule uh, that that predicts whether you restructure once or twice. You can see that Sri Lanka is on the cusp of this line, which means the direction in which governance goes in Sri Lanka is the direction of sustainable economic recovery. So let me just end with that thought and take up questions later. Thank you. Thanks very much. I, I'm 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 going to come back to you and talk a little bit about what are your recommendations for this governance uh, phase. I'm going to turn now to Nilanti Samarnayaka. Nilanti, you know this has been an interesting moment as we here in Washington we're just global competition, especially between the U.S. and China, but also India is, uh, and Japan have been important creditors and important allies of Sri Lanka as well. Can you talk a little bit about how this crisis and a year out, how have the relations changed and how is a country like Sri Lanka faring or you know managing in this era of geopolitical competition? Sure. Uh, <clears throat> thanks a lot, uh, Tamina. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I'll, I'll provide some personal observations on uh, the situation a, a year later. Um, overall, Sri Lanka's relationship with India has grown much stronger, especially in terms of economics. And the defense ties were already pretty close. In contrast, China's response to the crisis has been very disappointing and still presents Sri Lanka with much uncertainty regarding Beijing's next steps. And as you mentioned, last week we saw the Sri Lankan president travel to India in a short visit. They discussed various topics like cooperation on land and ferry connectivity. They talked about some of their persistent fishing disputes and developing Trincomalee into a regional energy and industrial hub. But taking a step back, it's useful to think about Sri Lanka and smaller states more broadly as a key grouping that warrant greater analytical attention. And I see a framework with three components that can enhance our understanding of smaller states and in particular Sri Lanka. So first, they have a clear set of needs. Second, they have concerns, especially as they navigate major power rivalry. And third, they have surprising strengths, despite their smaller size. So first, regarding needs. With Sri Lanka in the past year, it's been focused on its economic needs, understandably. And India has been a critical partner to Sri Lanka, mostly through lines of credit, currency swaps, and deferred repayments. But India has also remained its primary defense partner with three major outputs in the past year, delivery of a Dornier maritime surveillance aircraft, their annual defense dialogue, and the Slinex naval exercise. Second, in terms of concerns, Sri Lanka is a smaller South Asian country that is increasingly caught up in strategic competition between larger powers. And so Sri Lanka, we see it trying to maintain its agency in foreign policy, but it's also needed to acknowledge India's growing regional standing and capabilities, as well as its global standing, as India is president of the G20. And it's also had to factor in the added complication of China-India rivalry. So in August of last year, we saw Sri Lanka conduct 
frantic diplomacy with both India and China, and reportedly the United States, after its decision to permit a Chinese ship visit to Hambantota port in the south. So there are clearly challenges for smaller states in navigating large power tensions and experiencing pressure on themselves. And there were some indications that the Sri Lankan president and Indian prime minister, they spoke about this issue last week and how Sri Lanka can be sensitive to India's security concerns. And one idea that has moved forward is what's been called a standard operating procedure or SOP for future port calls by official military craft and foreign research vessels. And the Sri Lankan foreign minister subsequently confirmed that Sri Lanka has finalized this SOP. At the same time, we've seen the Sri Lankan president discuss how Sri Lanka is a neutral country, but he also emphasized the fact that, quote, we cannot allow Sri Lanka to be used as a base for any threats against India, end quote. So I think we'll need to see how this SOP will actually be implemented. So what ship visits will be permitted in the coming year, what won't be permitted. And that will include military as well as non-military, especially. But it's worth noting this theme that the Sri Lankan president mentioned is consistent across some other smaller South Asian countries as they're navigating this dynamic of major power rivalry. For instance, just in the past month, we've seen heads of state or foreign ministers from Bangladesh, Maldives, and Sri Lanka speak to their approach of trying to maintain independence, which highlights their desire for agency as smaller states. And Sri Lankan and Maldivian officials in particular speaking to their desire for peace amid China-India rivalry, and then taking that extra step and discussing sensitivities to India's concerns in particular. And then third, Sri Lanka has strengths that can be surprising to observers, despite its smaller size as an Indian Ocean island state. Colombo port, it consistently ranks as the top South Asian port in Lloyd's list, even despite a drop in its ranking after the economic crisis. And Sri Lanka has been stepping up its Indian Ocean and maritime security leadership, like through the Colombo security conclave. And later this year, Sri Lanka will assume the chair of the Indian Ocean Rim Association Association after serving as vice chair for the past two years. So we see Sri Lanka as a smaller state operating in a position of leadership in regional architecture. So to wrap up by this time next year, next summer, it'll be important to take another temperature check on not only where Sri Lanka stands in terms of its needs, will it be on track in terms of meeting its economic goals, but also how it's addressing concerns and pressures of major power rivals but at the same time, how will it be demonstrating strengths that may not necessarily be expected of it, particularly at this difficult time in its history? And I'll, I'll pause there. Thanks very much, Nalanti. I have, uh, I'm sure our viewers have lots of questions for you as well. Please, I encourage the audience um, to go onto our website at usip.org. And uh, if you're following along, there's a question box and you can please submit your questions. But I actually have plenty of questions and we're starting to get questions from the audience as well. Ambika, I want to open up with uh, some questions for you on, you talk about the lack of resistance or the need for resistance to what, you know, some of the repressive laws, the lack of accountability, lack of real governance and, and structural reforms on, on many things, whether it's the Terrorism Act or the executive presidency. How do you see the politics of the country playing out? Are there political parties which are there, whether they are in the South, but also in the North and the East? How do you see see the politics playing out at this moment? Are, is there an effective coalition of parties, maybe from the North and East, who might be able to stand up um, and demand elections? How do you see this unfolding? We are hearing that um, the first elections, maybe next year, presidential elections, but no parliamentary elections in sight. Um, some people have talked about whether a unity government or something going back to the good governance era. I, I invite your insights on that. Well, uh, <laughs> I don't think any of the parties at present actually want an election, certainly not a parliamentary election, because everyone is afraid that they're going to see a dip in their previous, you know, uh, the wins, what they, the number of seats they won. Uh, so I don't think anyone wants it. 
Uh, at the same time, you know, there was agitation for the local government elections, but you would have noted that even that has uh, fallen by the wayside. And if we're talking about a change or a government that has the trust of the people, we really do need not even the local government or the presidential elections, but we really do need uh, parliamentary elections. That's what matters. But once again, if Ranil Vikramasinghe continues to be president and let's say, you know, he calls it, he dissolves parliament and calls elections uh, next week then uh, if uh, if we get um uh, uh, you know uh, well, well, the UNP his own party is certainly not going to win enough seats which means he'll have to go into coalition government with whom will he be able to go and how history shows that coalition governments really don't do well because we do not know how to work with each other and um uh, also uh, I don't think any one party is going to win enough seats to form a government because all of them, while JVP will probably see an increase, uh, it's certainly not going to be enough to form a government. And SJB, SLPP, everyone's going to see a dip. Maybe UNP will see a slight increase, but once again, not enough to form a government, which means we'll be back at this, you know, we'll have this impasse or we'll have a government that once again will lead to, you know, the Ranil Chandrika 2002 government. What happened to that? Then 2015, Sirisena, Ranil, and now I do not know. So, um, yeah, we, we don't see much hope uh, in that in the political community or the political class. Hmm. Um, I want to turn a little bit to uh, how the North and the East are doing. I mean, one of the criticisms of the Aragalia was that it didn't necessarily represent uh, the concerns of folks in the North and the East, and especially minority and vulnerable communities, as you mentioned, both uh, Hindus and also Muslims in the East. But the current administration has announced that they are trying to establish a truth and reconciliation mechanism more than a decade after the Civil War ended. What do you make of these efforts? And also, how how are the communities responding? I mean, when I was just in Sri Lanka, I mean, some of the things you write about were very apparent that there are a lot of vulnerabilities both in the North and the East. So I welcome your thoughts on that. I've been very vocal about the, the TRC. Uh, my, my question is, uh, why do we need to wait resources and, uh, you know, enact another law and set up another institution when we'd had several similar commissions in the past, truth-seeking mechanisms. We have uh, unpublished reports of some of those mechanisms. Some reports have been published. We've got hundreds of recommendations, none of which have been implemented. If the government began implementing those recommendations, then I think it would solve about at least 50% of the problems. Uh, secondly, they themselves uh, I think it was either the president or the foreign minister, I can't recall, in a tweet, they, they they themselves said that this would be a way of escaping scrutiny. Well, they didn't use the word escaping, but preventing Sri Lanka from being subject to another Human Rights Council resolution. Thirdly, the the North and East really has no faith. That has been illustrated by not just one, but four different statements issued over the last week by different civil society groups that work with the victims in the North and the East. And how can they expect people to have trust when, uh, just a couple of days ago, in Colombo, when they were trying to commemorate the 40-year uh, anniversary of the 1983 riots, uh, thugs turned up. Uh, police did nothing to stop them. Instead, they use force against the people who were commemorating. Uh, we continuously, the, the surveillance, intimidation, harassment of civil society organizations, of former combatants, of people out on bail under the PTA, even people discharged from PT, uh, from cases under the PTA. That is continuing. I have plenty of cases. People call me all the time, people I know who have assisted, you know, uh, and so that happens. Uh, how can you expect people to have faith? And most importantly, do we really want to re-traumatize the families, the victims? They appeared before every commission. And the, the irony here is that despite their opposition, now they will say they don't want it. But if they do establish an institution, they will appear before it. Why? Because they're so desperate, because they think maybe this will give me an answer. But when we know it won't, it will only re-traumatize them. Why are we doing it?
That is uh, disheartening. Are there any of the mechanisms even at the local level that are producing any results? I, you know, the reparations uh, that have been giving out some for missing persons. Are any of the uh, current mechanisms working or anything that's politically feasible in the near term? No, there they aren't. The OMP, the Office of Missing Persons, really, we've seen no progress. Also, the the people who were appointed to it not really suitable, and then we don't hear anything from them. The families say they, some of them haven't even received acknowledgments for the cases that they have submitted. No progress. Same with the Office of the Reparations, and I think this has a lot to do with a political will. Who do you appoint to these institutions? The financial resources you give them, but more the political will, because these institutions also take their cue uh, from uh, the, you know, the 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 government. Mm -hmm. And once again, it's about also who who do you appoint to these institutions? Sure. A related question. I got a question online here for you. What is the relationship between the political elites and the security forces and how do they perpetuate the dynamics of impunity that you mentioned? And what are the real possible? Are there any real possibilities for reform in these sectors? Wow. Um, I would say right now, no possibility, but this is one sector that desperately needs reform because the military has grown uh Funnily enough, after the end of the war, during the Rajapaksa era, after the end of the war, it has grown in ways that I think even the government is not aware of uh, in terms of, you know, probably internal uh, informal structures, etc. And they are still, they've still got businesses running. They still interfere with civil society. They participate in even uh, drafting of the laws like the anti-terror bill, the rehabilitation bureau bill. I have an upcoming piece that will be published in the next two days uh, that speaks about this whole militarization. So it's a sector that needs to be reformed. But none of the southern parties are willing to touch it. During the Aragalia, because we saw militarization or the military being engaged in quelling protest, they started speaking about it in the South and they've started asking questions. Why are they involved in, in uh, policing? And you've seen, we've seen think tanks talk about the military budget, critiquing the budget, saying that the military has to be downsized or right-sized, whichever term you prefer, you know, in reference to the economic crisis, the IMF, etc. But no one talks about why is the military still taking over private land in the north and the east to expand military camps? Why haven't they released land? Why is the military uh, assisting the Department of Archaeology and Buddhist monks to destroy Hindu temples and build Buddhist uh, temples? So those questions really the South is still not asking. The Southern political parties do not want to touch it with the barge pole. A great example is that if you look at the past three years, and I've tweeted this religiously over the past three years, years, the Auditor General's report on the military, the Army, Navy, and the Air Force. Plenty of instances of financial misuse, mismanagement, wastage. But have those reports been, de uh, been debated in Parliament? No. Instead, we've had opposition parties, even, you know, the Sajid Premadasa critiquing the U.S. when they sanctioned or they put a place to travel ban on uh, Shavindra Silva. So hence the, the, the connection between the southern political parties and the military uh, structure is strong. Even if it isn't, they are loath to critique them and call them to account because they're afraid that it will impact their vote base. Great. Thank you very much for that, Ambika. I'm going to Jamana, turn to you. Can I John. come in on a couple of questions? Yes, that you asked, please. Feel uh, free to answer mind, yeah. those. And then I have a, I have several questions for you, Nishan. I'm so sure you do. Please. Uh, so just on a very quick one, on the, you asked this question about, um, you know, what can be done, low-hanging fruit. Uh, yes, on the north and east. I think there's one that's very obvious, and I'm surprised that even India has taken a greater interest. Sri Lanka has a 13th Amendment to the Constitution, which promised uh, substantial devolution, not enough, not perfect, uh, but incompletely executed. And mm -hmm. the, one of the easiest things to do is to complete land devolution, and all it requires is an administrative action to set up a national land commission. 
So land devolution is in the constitution, but it is administratively not implemented because it's unlocked by creating a national land commission. So I would say we need to aim for things like that, that are easy, quick, don't require really, you know, any constitutional change, but go a significant distance uh, in demonstrating good faith of the government uh, in moving uh, forward the promise of Sri Lanka's constitution and devolution. I want to come on one other thing. Sure. Uh, Ambika, Ambika talked about, I think, uh, elections and how it could create a hung parliament. Look, I want to be a little more hopeful about the possibility Please. of elections. Uh, I think there is an argument in Sri Lanka, and it's not Ambika's argument, uh, that stability is the most important thing and that we must maintain stability and elections can wait. Uh, and I think uh, different, and I, I'm sure Ambika agrees with me on this, uh, uh, that legitimacy is the most important thing, that a government that needs to drive changes uh, to governance, uh, reform corruption, uh, change the pathway of the economy needs legitimacy more than anything else. And right. without an election, we cannot get legitimacy. And I think uh, we need to think that, you know, people must have the good sense to know how to vote uh, and we must give them a chance uh, with an election. Uh, and then Sri Lanka perhaps gets into a better situation in terms of being able to solve its problems. So let me just, uh, you know, make. No, those I, I want to I want to draw you out a little bit. I, Anna, may I, if I may, just because I Please. do not want to miss the understanding on this at all. I When I said no one wants elections, I didn't mean the people they do want and I didn't mean me, I do want elections. I meant the members of parliament. And I am with Nishan where I think, oh God, the stability is absolute nonsense because we don't have stability. And the hung parliament is what could potentially happen. But that does not mean that we shouldn't have. We should have, and we should have had elections long before. So I didn't want any misunderstanding. No, of that. course. Okay, thank you. Nishan, I want to go back to you on this uh, idea of, you know, of legitimacy. So most people that I talked to when I was just in Sri Lanka were, they don't find the current parliament uh, legitimate because it doesn't reflect the people's wishes and, and they do want elections. But there were a lot of politicians who talked about this idea of bringing all the parties together, a unity government. What do you think of that? Is that even possible? Is that something that could work? They felt that that would maybe offer legitimacy with stability. Yeah, uh, so thank you for that. A unity government is meaningful only in as much the opinions of all the parties are reasonably reflected in the decisions government makes. Uh, there is a great deal of opportunity for that already in the parliament by, for instance, allowing the opposition leadership in parliamentary committees. Now, if the space available for allowing the opposition to have a meaningful voice in parliament is already not utilized and significantly suppressed, actually, against the standing orders of parliament as well, then I think the offer of a unity government becomes uh, simply a window dressing, uh, which and a, not a meaningful engagement mm -hmm. uh, of allowing all views to shape parliament. So I think a unity government would be great if there was real uh, intention of, sure. uh, which is not currently not reflected in the practices of, of the government. Of course. So we have several questions on corruption and corruption was something that was one of the demands during the Aragalia as well. And you mentioned it in terms of lack of governance. Um, so I, I want to ask you that parliament did pass an anti-corruption bill last week as part of their IMF commitments. How effective do you think this measure will be and what impact will it have on the economy? But, uh, you know, on on debt, on other parts of governance? Yeah, uh, this was an important bill, uh, and it's a very significant improvement on the law that is currently in place. It incorporated, uh, in addition to anti-corruption uh, sort of unit in government, also transparency measures with regards to asset declarations, which is very positive, and had been brought separately to parliament by a private member, but is now incorporated in this bill. The proof of the pudding, of course, is in the eating, Tamana. Mm -hmm. uh, and when we see a high-profile politician prosecuted, we will know that something is working. 
Uh, unfortunately, every time Sri Lanka passed new laws, even in setting the current anti-corruption unit, there has been great hope that this will now solve our problems. We have been uh, rather adept at creating institutions that then didn't deliver. And I think uh, uh, Ambika also mentioned things like the missing persons office, etc. So I, I think there is we, we can have hope again, but uh, it is very important to realize that the government is itself uh, does not have an incentive mm -hmm. uh, because of uh, what how it is composed of and the uh, and the actors in parliament to take corruption seriously and it is not showing that it does so if it was serious there's a very important parliamentary committee called the committee on public uh, uh, on current that works on corruption committee on public enterprises now that committee is required by the standing orders of parliament to be led by a member of the opposition uh, but actually the government has not allowed that and even a government member who was acting somewhat independently has been removed and replaced with someone more compliant. So the government is demonstrating that it is not serious about corruption while passing laws that, of course, the IMF has asked. So I think if the law can still do its work despite government resistance, then we wish it well. But the proof of the pudding is in the eating. Interesting. Is there anything that international partners, the U.S. included, can do to make this more, uh, you know, more real to have some teeth to actually solve some of the corruption issues? I think giving a great deal more weight to governance related commitments on the IMF program and making assistance fairly clearly connected to improvements in governance and reduction in corruption uh, can go a long way because otherwise, even the assistance that flows into Sri Lanka does not flow over, you know, to enough to the general population uh, because at the level of vested, infra vested interest influence that Sri Lanka has, uh, this is what's causing an, uh, the economy to crash and be undermined. So I think, you know, it's always good to understand that there's a lot of leverage uh, and incentives uh, that the international community can offer for Sri Lanka to improve its governance. And it's not only corruption, but corruption is a significant part of that. In a, being very targeted and very precise in asking Sri Lanka for outcomes, not just processes, not just institutions, but actual outcomes in advancing mm -hmm. corruption mitigation and improving governance, that would be the ticket, I think. Okay, thank you, Nishan. We have a couple of questions for you on debt restructuring. Earlier this month, there was the program for debt re domestic debt restructuring was announced, and I know there was um, there has been some criticism of it. But is the process the Parliament approved a sustainable and equitable solution to a fairly complex issue in terms of domestic debt? Yeah. So Sri Lanka did something very strange with domestic debt restructuring. <laughs> Uh, you know, when countries restructure domestic debt, they usually try to make it as equitable as possible, and that is to treat everyone equally, but also they look at protecting the vulnerable. So, for instance, retirement income funds are the ones that are touched the last, uh, and you try to avoid touching them. Sri Lanka chose to put the entire burden of domestic debt restructure exclusively on the, large, on the retirement income funds of workers in the country. So that I think is extremely unusual, but also reflects the kind of vested interest influence uh, in Sri Lanka that allowed private bondholders, equity holders of banks, who had already priced in the risk of a restructure to get windfall gains, while workers who are forced to put their savings in government and already having government invested for poor returns are now forced into a 16-year program of having very poor returns on their investments in government securities and their retirement earnings. So I think this is just an indication of all the problems we're talking about in terms of governance and how, how the weak are uh, paying the price uh, for those who have power to influence decision-making.
I want to ask you one broader question about, you know, the lessons learned. I mean, it's only been a year. The recovery is just nascent. But, you know, this um, debt vulnerable vulnerability that Sri Lanka um, experienced and hit default, this is not uh, unique to Sri Lanka. Many countries in Asia and in Africa post-COVID have really found that the borrowing that they've been financing you know, much of their spending with has become a vulnerability for them. And they are all also facing the same things that you raised in your in your remarks the poverty has increased and there is no jobs there is not um, we're not able to increase jobs are there lessons here that Sri Lanka is learning uh, that can be applied or that you would offer to other similarly placed uh, countries that have this debt vulnerability I think uh, Sri Lanka's uh, particular crisis emerges not only from global conditions that turned adverse, but from specific decisions on taxation, public finance uh, that really drove Sri Lanka deeply into the crisis. For instance, uh, Sri Lanka's interest cost is 78% of government revenue, the highest in the world even today. And it has been since 2020 when Sri Lanka cut its taxes. Uh, so I think one lesson to learn is your, you know, you have to make sure that when your economy is growing, your tax base is growing in a way that government revenue grows with it. In Sri Lanka, it's been a little bit the other way around, where the the revenue to GDP has come down as the economy has grown, which means that too many people got tax holidays. There was too little collection. So key lesson, grow your tax base and revenue to government. Don't go for the cheap approach to growth by giving tax holidays willy-nilly uh, that ultimately puts your country into crisis, I think. Uh, and I think, you know, when you have to cut government, reduce your budget deficits, don't take it from healthcare, education, and social welfare. These are enormous investments uh, in human beings that have long-term dividends and payouts for the country. Sri Lanka is still benefiting from historical investments we made in a free-for-all healthcare system and education system. But those dividends are declining because we are not producing uh, you know, universities and scholars that are competitive in the world anymore. Uh, and we can't, you know, continue to live on past investments. You have to redo them all, all over. So I would just keep those two lessons. Learn to tax in a way that your growth uh, is reflected in the growth of your taxes uh, and invest in human beings. Uh, and, and that's not the first place to cut uh, when you want to manage your public finance is better. Thank you for that, Nishan. Uh, folks in the audience, we have about 10 minutes left, so please continue to send in your questions. I want to turn to you, Nilanti. You know, uh, Sri Lanka is in a key location in the Indian Ocean, and definitely we at USIP are trying to put the Indo back in the Indo-Pacific strategy. So I want to hear from you. Are there ways that Sri Lanka can benefit more from the Indo-Pacific strategy, whether it's IPAF or um, uh, maritime domain awareness. How is it? Is it playing M? Um, is Indo-Pacific strategy, the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy, um, benefiting Sri Lanka at all? How can it take better advantage of some of the programs there, both on the security side, but I think also the economic side? Yeah, that's a great question, Tamana. Uh, I mean, first of all, I think the Indo-Pacific strategy, it, it was when it was released, it really focused, at least within South Asia, it focused on India and the importance of supporting India's leadership in South Asia and the Indian Ocean. But I think one of the, the oversights was not mentioning the, the smaller South Asian states like Sri Lanka. Uh, so I, I think as the uh, the government you know, continues to, the U.S. government continues to, to update its thinking and its policies, I, I think acknowledging those smaller partners would, would be a, a welcome addition to a Subsequent, subsequent version of the strategy. But in terms of policy, we do see U.S. policy uh, being responsive to Sri Lanka's economic crisis uh, in, in terms of the, the assistance the U.S. government has provided. Um, also, uh, you know, we there it really, I think, speaks to a disconnect between U.S. strategy and U.S. policy, uh, because we were, at least in terms of uh, thinking about international relations and strategic competition, you know, it's it, it's all about China. Uh, so in, in terms of thinking of, you know, 
know, who, who are partners to, to bring along. Of course, you know, India, we, we saw a very successful visit by Prime Minister Modi uh, to, to the United States recently. So uh, I think that's, you know, that, that kind of is, has been the focus uh, in terms of U.S. policy. Uh, but uh, but you know, U.S. policy has also, uh, I think, tried to be responsive to the economic crisis. Um, and then there, there's also been some longstanding efforts to increase defense and security ties with Sri Lanka. Um, ha- hasn't always been successful, uh, like with the discussion about the Status of Forces Agreement a few years ago. Um, but you know, it has been successful in other ways, such as the transfer of uh, retired Coast Guard cutters and, and helping Sri Lanka with its consistent maritime security objectives. So those aren't going away. So I think that's that reflects a, a positive uh, emphasis in, in terms of U.S. policy and, and will help Sri Lanka uh, continue to try to climb its way out of the economic crisis because the, the maritime domain is, is so important to Sri Lanka in, in terms of its, its economic objectives and, and wider objectives. I want to draw you a little bit out on the India-China component uh, of the relationship with Sri Lanka. I mean, here in Washington, we might think that the default and it might have pushed Sri Lanka, you know, to be pro-India and sort of turned its back on Chinese debt, but that's not actually the case. I mean, most people are very were very upset about the Rajapaksas. They were upset about the debt, but they're not necessarily uh, upset about China. And I think there's still some hope that China, with its infrastructure development, et cetera, could be useful for Sri Lanka. And at the same time, even with all the Indian assistance, you you spoke with folks and they're very wary of India being too involved, uh, you know, sort of the big brother in the region. Uh, they're, they're, they are still wary about India. So how is Sri Lanka and, and particularly uh, President Vikramasinghe, how are they managing that very complex relationship? It is indeed complex because, as you mentioned, China is still a very important partner to Sri Lanka and uh, the Sri Lankan officials are really kind of emphasizing their hope Hope that, that China will be responsive to Sri Lanka in terms of the debt restructuring. So that, that response has obviously uh, been very disappointing uh, to uh, Sri Lankan officials. Uh, but you know, wh- what what can they do? They're, they're really just kind of waiting on, on China in that regard. Uh, and in addition, uh, the China still represents a source of potential foreign direct investment for Sri Lanka. Discussion recently about a potential refinery deal in the southern part of the country in Hamburg. Manthoda. Um, Sinopec also recently signed a deal for fuel. Um, so, you know, they're, they're still, they're, they're not going away. Ch- China is still a, an important player here. Uh, but in terms of India, the, the past year has really shown a, a greater reliance on India economically. Its, its response has been standout to Sri Lanka, and it's been uh, much, much appreciated. Um, but at the same time, it, it does raise questions in terms of Sri Lanka's foreign policy and its strategic outlook in terms of what will its room for uh, operating and freedom of action, what, what will that look like? Uh, so I, I think this standard operating procedure that was previewed before the Sri Lankan president's visit to India and was subsequently confirmed by the foreign minister, I think this will be interesting to watch in the next 12 months, essentially. What ship visits will Sri Lanka permit? You know, will, will any be Chinese? I mean, that you know, that that's that's a big question. And I I think we we need to see that slight change uh, essentially in the context of Sri Lanka's economic crisis because that, that discussion d- didn't exist before. Tamana, can I come in briefly on this? You know, yeah, as please, an economist, ahead, as an economist, I I prefer not to think about is it a Chinese investment, an Indian investment, or sure. an American investment, but to think about is it a competitively bid out investment that is the gets the best company to provide the best outcome in Sri Lanka. So the problem with these contracts is not the country of origin of the contractors uh, or the investing party. It is the method or process followed in providing it that most of this, quite a few of these have had no competitive bidding, have had, you know, tax holidays that have been, you know, put into the contracts, which means that it does not translate into government revenue and is not economically, therefore, justifiably better beneficial for the country against other alternatives. So I, you know, I, while I understand
understand it, there are geopolitical questions. I think we should get out of the question of which country, and we certainly would not have concern if American companies invested in Sri right. Lanka, provided they were competitively bid out. Uh, and, the, and the offers were genuinely allowing the country to benefit in a way that shared the profits of the company uh, with the government in taxes as well. So just to leave that thought. No, no, I think that's important. I think the, the question of equity and transparency and sort of process is very important there. I, I just have very one more minute. Ambika, I have a, a question here following up on the TRC about in 2013, during a, a previous Rajapaksa government, um, there were attempts made with South African TRC experts. What makes those attempts different from now with, uh, with the present hybrid regime? I don't think there's any difference at all because it was during the Rajapaksa regime. We also had the the Udalagama Commission, the Parnagama Commission, the Lessons Learned and Reconciliation Commission, all of which published reports. And some of the recommendations in even in those reports were actually not bad. And if they could perhaps begin by uh, implementing them, we'd save everyone a lot of money, energy, and uh, prevent the re-traumatization of the victims. No, very important point. I want to give you a minute. Any last um, comments, recommendations for folks here in Washington, but also folks in Colombo and elsewhere on how we can move the recovery forward? Please. I, I, I will make our uh, Islamic sure. so, Go yeah. ahead, um, Nishan. Nishan, why don't you start and then I'll go back to Ambika. Sure. I would say, you know, it's governance, governance and governance. Uh, Sri Lanka's economic crisis is foundationally a governance crisis. And it would be very short term and an unsustainable fix that Sri Lanka gets if we tried to recover the economy without recovering governance to a different place than it has been in the last 20, 30 years. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ambika, over to you for yes. last. Um, take, yeah, taking on from Nishan, I, I agree, couldn't agree more. And But my point is that we think that governance or governance reforms only means uh, enacting yet another law, establishing yet another institution. We do not acknowledge the existing systemic structural uh, dysfunctionalities and identify that it's, it's a culture that's there. It's habit, it's process. So we need to focus on that as well and not tick the box, which is what many in the international community and the multilateral and bilateral donors do. Nilanthi, I'll give you the last word. Do you have any recommendations um, for international partners of, the, of Sri Lanka, including the US, of course, on how we can help the recovery? I think this discussion has shown just the the significant work that lies ahead for Sri Lanka in terms of the systemic challenges, governance challenges, and international partners in the world are, are really watching Sri Lanka. And they, they look at its key role in the Central Indian Ocean uh, in terms of uh, what it contributes to, to regional trade and, and also uh, really regional security as well. So I think we'll, we'll keep watching. Thank you so much. On behalf of the U.S. Institute of Peace, I want to thank you all for, for tuning in to this uh, important discussion. We want to continue to engage with Sri Lanka and Sri Lankans and look towards a brighter future. I want to give a very um, warm thank you to Ambika Satgunathan, Nishan Damel, and Nilanti Samarnayaka for joining us today. Thank you all and look forward to staying in touch. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Tamana. You, Tamana.